Hello, this is Talking Europe on France 24. Now, as the Russian war on Ukraine continues with, of course, significant loss of civilian life in Ukraine, warnings are also being sounded about the knock-on effects of the war on people far from Europe. This due to the massive hit to food production and exports from Ukraine and from Russia, two states that together provide more than 750 million people in 27 countries with more than half of their total wheat needs, along with other foodstuffs. The European Union has been looking at ways to shore up supplies. This will be one of the focuses of our interview today with the head of the European Parliament's Development Committee, MEP Thomas Tobe from Sweden, joining us today on the line from Brussels. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Thomas Tobe. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to start, Mr. Tobe, by playing you and our viewers a, a warning that we heard this week from the F World Food Programme. Uh, this is spokesman Thomson Firi. Ukraine used to feed 400 million people worldwide and it's so easy to see uh, tracts of arable land, rich soils, uh, good rains, mechanized agriculture. But the problem now is that a huge question mark now looms on, next, on the next harvest uh, because those agricultural fields are now the battlefields and this the impact will be felt thousands and thousands of miles away from the battlefield. Thomson Ferry from the World Food Programme there. Uh, Thomas Tobi, uh, we heard there about this impact being felt thousands and thousands of miles away from those battlefields. Um, how concerned are you about these food shortages? Frankly, I am uh, extremely worried uh, since we had a huge uh, problem uh, with hunger in the world even before uh, the invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine and the war. Uh, I mean, 800 million uh, people go to bed hungry uh, every day. And now we know that the effects will be huge. Uh, and especially on developing countries where we have the most vulnerable uh, people. So what we need to do now is that we really need to step up our action. We need to increase production within Europe, but also outside of Europe. Mm. And we need to adapt our humanitarian assistance to developing countries because we will see huge numbers of uh, hunger uh, in the coming uh, months. One of the big announcements about to ha how to remedy that production gap that you mentioned, um, the, the European Union says it's going to allow farmers to use land that currently they leave aside for environmental reasons uh, to actually grow food on that land. Um, is this really necessary, given that environmentalists point out the importance of leaving some land aside to recover each season? I mean, uh, I think in Europe it, 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 is, it is clear that, uh, I mean, we need to do more to, to make sure that we can reach our climate goals, uh, that we need to protect biodiversity, uh, and that we need to modernize uh, also our own agriculture uh, in Europe. But we also uh, need to be pragmatic. We are in an extreme situation. We have a war in Europe. And then, of course, we need to look at all possibilities now, because if we do not do this, this would actually mean that people will die of hunger. Mm. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. So we need to increase our production in Europe, but of course also with our humanitarian aid, make sure uh, that uh, we do uh, our part. Um, just wondering what specifically you mean by that. I imagine more money, which could, of course, be a bit of a tough ask for governments that are already uh, seeing their populations under uh, quite huge cost of living pressure at, the, at this point. Yes. I mean, we already had a funding gap uh, before uh, the war in uh, Ukraine, uh, but the need now will grow. We need to mobilize uh, a lot of money. Uh, to, to cope with the situation in Ukraine. And we still have other crises in the world, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Syria, just to mention a few. But my point and my message to the member states is uh, I understand that there will be some hard choices to make, that mm -hmm. they need more spending for uh, defence, that we have higher prices for many of our citizens in Europe. But if we do not fund the humanitarian needs that we have now, then we will have other problems. We will have more 
conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have more uh, issues related to migration and so on. So I don't think it's only a, a moral responsibility now uh, to make sure that we actually meet humanitarian needs. It's also in Europe's own interest to understand that we need to step up because it's basically a few countries that take responsibility for the humanitarian assistance in Europe today mm -hmm. and more countries need to come on board. Well, Thomas Tobe, let's take a look at the plight of refugees currently fleeing Ukraine. Uh, more than four million of them have left their country so far. Uh, I'd like to take a look at how the EU's biggest member state, Germany, is handling the situation at its end. We've got this report from our correspondents Anne Meyer and Nick Spicer. They've barely got here and they're already attacking the paperwork. In front of this neighborhood administration in Berlin, the Ukrainian refugees line up daily to get health insurance and soon a job. In any case, that's what IRA wants. I hope it will be easy and I think that one or two months uh, and I will get a job because um, I'm good in IT, logistics, marketing, sales. In her case, the prospects are good. Germany has a chronic labor shortage. This company, a European leader in mobile payment terminals, has 400 jobs to fill and is actively recruiting Ukrainians. We insist that we would be really happy to receive their applications and we can also help them with visas and relocation. A dozen odd Ukrainians fleeing the war are already in the process of being recruited. It's not cynical to say we want to give these refugees a chance to work in their sector and that we also benefit as a company. But what is also important for the companies that are recruiting now is that they should be ready to invest in Ukraine as well when all of this is over. In Germany, a number of specialized websites is already up and running. This one, created by Ivan Kichetti and three other young Ukrainian entrepreneurs based in Berlin, received 8,000 job offers in three weeks. This is the, the first and the most sustainable uh, step to, to integrate into, into, the, into the society, which should happen, right, because uh, we really hope that this ends soon, uh, but some people are going to stay here. There are more than a million and a half jobs up for grabs in Germany. Ukrainians who have come here or to other EU countries immediately get access to the job market as soon as they get their residency papers. Thomas Tobey, we're seeing that um, some employers uh, in Germany uh, saying that they're very happy to receive these uh, people and, and give them jobs. Sweden is expecting around 76,000 Ukrainians to arrive in the coming months. Uh, is Sweden equipped to deal with this influx? And do you also see this as a, a good thing in a way for your country to have these people coming in and, and, and taking up jobs? I think that uh, Sweden and uh, many other uh, member states uh, have uh, learned uh, some lessons uh, before the last refugee crisis in 2015. Uh, and I think we are better equipped now. Uh, and I also think that we have a better opportunity uh, to get Ukrainians integrated to our society early on. Uh, I think, of course, for many of the women that come, they need to find a job. Uh, that is important, of course, uh, for them. And for the children, we have to make sure that we can offer them school. Uh, I also think that uh, I know that many member states are, are doing a lot, but I actually think that we should have even a broader solidarity from Europe uh, when it comes to funding, because uh, since so many are children coming, uh, we need to make sure that we can actually fund school for Ukrainian children. Mm -hmm. And I think that the EU needs to step up and actually give that to the member states and fund it. Because in that way, we can also keep this solidarity working in real terms uh, in every local community in Europe. Now, you mentioned uh, previous refugee influxes. Some people are asking, you know, with the way that Europe is opening its arms to these Ukrainian refugees, um, shouldn't the same really be done for, say, Afghans, who you mentioned earlier, who are fleeing the return of the Taliban and, and people fleeing other conflicts and danger zones? Uh, well, I think it is important to understand that uh, Ukraine uh, is in our own neighbourhood. And that, of course, means that uh, Europe has a special uh, responsibility. 
And the same goes for other conflicts that we have in the world. Most people uh, flee to a country that is, is close from the country that you need to flee from. And of course then they will have uh, the big uh, challenge uh, to cope with that. So in that sense I would say it's, it's different. We have a bigger responsibility. But of course uh, if, a peop if a person has uh, asylum reasons, uh, of course you should have that application uh, granted in Europe. Mm -hmm. But we also know that uh, it's always like this, that we need to support the neighborhood in the conflicts. But at this time, Europe is the neighborhood and that is our responsibility. I'd just like to ask you a brief question about Sweden's potential NATO membership. Uh, you recently said your moderate party would submit an application to NATO immediately after the election if there was a majority in Parliament. Why such a big pivot towards NATO membership after two centuries of neutrality? I think it is uh, clear uh, that Sweden uh, needs to, to build security uh, together with others. I think it is uh, clear that Putin's uh, aggression uh, uh, will not stop with Ukraine. And we will have to take responsible uh, decision for Sweden. And for me, it is clear that we need the security uh, that the NATO membership uh, will provide. Uh, I do not think that we should be neutral uh, against Putin. Uh, and I think actually the time for Sweden to be neutral has uh, long passed due. Um, so that is why I think it is important now that Sweden, together with Finland, mm -hmm. make the decision uh, to join NATO. All right, Thomas Tobe, that is all we have time for. Thank you so much for being with us on Talking Europe. Oh. And thanks to you for watching. See you soon.